my girl is here. Hello, my sweeties, and welcome back to my channel. If you don't already know me, my name is Elise, and thank you for joining my spooky little family. In today's video, we are on my couch to do a everything I watched in the month of October. Let's get into the video. So I think I actually watched, I think I watched like about 16 things in October, which is like a lot. I basically was watching something every day. Um, <laughs> uh, what's good about this is that I didn't only watch horror, so that's fun. I love mixing it up sometimes. Sometimes I have months where I only watch horror and I'm like, wow, I could really use like something a little different. Even though I'm never tired of horror, I mean, hello, this is a horror channel, this is my genre, but I don't know. Okay, so I guess we'll start with The Seven Year Itch. <laughs> okay, so I have seen The Seven Year Itch before. I watched it a long time ago when I first discovered Marilyn Monroe and I think I was about like 13 or something like that. Um, and it was around my time where I was very obsessed with Marilyn Monroe and Audrey Hepburn. But I decided to rewatch a bunch of Marilyn Monroe's movies after the monstrosity that is blonde because I was like, okay, well, let me just go and honor the queen the right way by watching all of her previous works. Uh, yeah, so The Seven Year Itch did not, I can't say it didn't age well. I mean, obviously, but I don't even think it was, like, good for that time. No, I get that there are a lot of things in this film that are iconic. We do have that iconic shot of Marilyn Monroe with the white dress and the dress is, like, flowing up. And yes, that is iconic. There are a lot of iconic moments in this film. But uh, Sherman gives me the ick, and that's all I wrote on Letterboxd. I actually gave it two out of five, and that's mostly because I found this film, out of all of her films, to be one of the most boring, and it has nothing to do with her. I just think the story itself is boring, and the character of Sherman, he's just kind of gross, and I don't care to see this gross man be weird about... This woman he thinks is very attractive and he just like can't control himself. Uh, yeah, not really for me. I don't really care to watch it again. <laughs> I'll probably watch Some Like It Hot until I die. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Okay, next up we do actually have a horror film. So I watched this film that hit Shudder recently and it is called Sissy. Um, this film was actually surprisingly really good and I don't know why. I, I didn't think it would be bad but I wasn't sure if it would be for me because I did see the trailer and was like, mm, okay, it could go either way. It is one of those horror films that is about an influencer and I have really no problem with that as long as it's done well because a lot of the time I feel like they're really cheesy and just like not really for me. Kind of like that film that came out on Shutter. I think it was last year that was about influencers that went to like this Airbnb. It was called Superhost. I did not love that movie and I felt like it was pretty empty. Um, but Sissy actually is not empty and it does have a really interesting message. I mean, also the acting from Aisha D was incredible like really incredible. And actually the acting from Hannah Barlow, who is also one of the directors on this film, was really great as well. It was just a lot of fun, very girly, very glittery. And it does have like some giallo elements. I did notice that in the final act, there is a song playing. And I don't wanna give anything away because this is a newer film. So if you guys haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. But there's this song playing in the final act that is 
almost identical to the song from The Red Queen Kills Seven Times. And I thought it was very interesting. It's a great moment. It was really cool. And yeah, I just really liked that. It was a lot of fun. There were a couple people that were telling me they would like to see me do an entire review of this film. So I did not rate it yet, uh, but I did think it was quite good. You may just see a standalone review coming of this one. Okay. Next up, I watched this film. <laughs> I actually watched this film because one of my patrons, Francis, shout out to Francis, he has been recommending me to watch Thelma and Louise for so long. This is one of those films that has been on my list for like forever, for basically my whole life, and I just never got to it. And I did see it was on HBO Max, and Francis had talked very highly about this film. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna do it. And so I ended up watching it, and I thought it was one of the best movies I have ever seen. I mean, like, this story is so good. The acting from Gina Davis and Susan Sarandon is so good. I mean, it is unmatched. They're incredible. They have amazing chemistry. The story is very compelling, and there's so many emotions you feel throughout the film. It's definitely an emotional roller coaster, and for that, I really love it. And it is directed by Ridley Scott, so I should have known it was going to be this good. But yeah, I just really loved it. And the ending really, it was one of those endings that had me feeling really sad, but it was also hopeful. And I was really shocked because I didn't know anything about this ending, which apparently is like known to be like iconic and so many people know about it. But I actually didn't know about the ending, so it did shock me. And I'm really happy that I didn't know much about it. But yeah, I actually ended up giving Thelma and Louise five stars out of five. And that is because the story is just, it's, it's very good. It's, it's very good. I just can't. I will probably be rewatching this film time and time again because it definitely is one of those films also that has comfort vibes. So I'm really happy that I ended up watching this one. Thanks again, Francis. Okay. So and now we're on to another older film from the 50s, and this is because I have a goal to watch every single Betty Davis film that she's ever made because I am so obsessed with her, and I've become obsessed with her since watching Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, and that is also thanks to one of my patrons. Thank you for recommending that. I actually did a full review of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, and you can find it on my channel. It was a lot of fun to talk about that film. But it has been a lot of fun watching all of Betty Davis's films. She has so many interesting films, and she plays such interesting roles, and I just adore her. I think she's really one of the best actresses of all time. So I ended up watching All About Eve. Now I think the one thing that really drew me to watching All About Eve was the fact that it was about this really famous actress and this younger woman wanting to be an actress and basically be like the new Margot Channing. Now anything that's about acting or anything like that. I just have to watch it. I also heard from a bunch of people saying that this was like a great film that had an impeccable script. So I'm like, okay, I really have to watch this. I really liked it. I mean, Betty Davis is amazing. And the woman who plays Eve was really great as well. Uh, her name was Anne Baxter. I thought she was really great. And just the acting from everyone is great. The film is gorgeous. Gorgeous black and white film. And yeah, it's a really fun movie. Definitely one that I will be re-watching in the future. I feel like this one also has like comfort vibes. So yeah, I really like that one. Ooh, okay. So now we're back to some horror. Um, <laughs> I actually recently watched Elvira's Haunted Hills. I watched this on the Joe Bob Halloween Hangout that was on Shudder a few weeks ago. And I did watch this with some of my patrons and that was a lot of fun. 
Um, so Elvira's Haunted Hills, I hadn't seen before this, but I had seen Mistress of the Dark. I love Mistress of the Dark. I think it's so funny. And she's just amazing. She's an amazing person. She's had an amazing life. I really admire Elvira. But yeah, I can't say that I loved Elvira's Haunted Hills as much as I loved Mistress of the Dark. I don't think they're the same in any kind of way. I mean, she, her performance is basically just as good, but I do think this one is a lot more silly and ridiculous than Mistress of the Dark. And that's not bad. I just think that the, the, I just think that the best part of Mistress of the Dark is its story and how like relatable it is. And this one is kind of just like really crazy Looney Tunes-esque kind of vibes. And that is not an insult. I, I did have a good time and it is funny. But if I did have to choose which one I like more, I would definitely say Mistress of the Dark. But if you haven't seen this one, I definitely recommend it. It was also really fun to watch with Joe Bob's commentary. So yeah, I gave Elvira's Haunted Hills two and a half stars. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, so this one I actually did not like at all. Um, and this is probably a hot take because there are so many people that really love this movie. I really do feel bad. Uh, saying that I didn't like it. I tried so many times to like this movie. Um, I did try to watch Popcorn like years ago and I didn't like it then. I actually found it really boring and I turned it off and went to sleep. But Joe Bob did have this film right after Elvira's Haunted Hills on the Halloween special. So I gave it another shot. It is really unfortunate that I don't like popcorn. So many people have said that this is very much like Scream and it's become this cult classic and I did really want to like it, but I just don't like anything about this film. I mean, I think the poster is quite cool. I actually really love it. I wish that the film was as cool as the poster for me, but it unfortunately just isn't. It didn't hit for me. I thought there was a lot of weird music. I thought the story was boring. I thought it was just a really boring film and it was losing me. At first it starts off kind of interesting and then I feel like it just goes all over the place and not in a good way for me. So yeah, popcorn unfortunately was not for me. I gave it one star. Okay, so next up we have the new Hellraiser. And uh, this is actually available on Hulu if you haven't seen the new Hellraiser, you should definitely check it out. Um, I didn't put a rating for this one because I wasn't sure if I would do a dedicated review for this film. I think I've decided now that I don't want to because I don't really think I have too much to say. Um, obviously on Letterboxd all I wrote here was I roll. Um, it's really unfortunate. I was pretty excited for this Hellraiser and I was really excited to see Jamie Clayton play Pinhead. Um, I thought she was incredible, but I feel like she didn't have too much to do, uh, which kind of just made me a little upset. I wanted more, but overall the story of this film it just didn't really hit for me. I And that's really all it is. I hear a lot of people really loved it and they resonated with this film and I'm really happy if you did. That's amazing. Uh, unfortunately, it just didn't hit for me as much as the original Hellraiser hits for me. I feel like this one lacks a lot of elements of the original and not to say that every remake needs to be exactly like the original because then that would be pointless. But I just didn't really love all the choices that were made here and I thought the story was just a bit generic. I did love the way that the Cenobites looked. I thought they looked really beautiful and I thought Jamie Clayton again was amazing. I love the voice that she put on. Like she was very captivating and enchanting when she was on the screen. And I love that. I was so happy to see a female pinhead as a pinhead is described in the book. So that was really cool. But outside of that, I didn't love it, unfortunately. And that's really sad. Um, 
Because I don't think I will review this film, I guess I can just tell you guys what I would rate it. I'd probably give it a two and a half and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up we have, ooh, this is a fun one. We have House of Darkness, and this one was directed by Neil Laboot, and it stars Justin Long and Kate Bosworth. I am a huge Justin Long fan. I've been a Justin Long fan for so long. I mean, everybody knows my Justin Long obsession. They know how real it is. Um, <laughs> but uh, this film is actually... It surprised me, it pleasantly surprised me. I saw the trailer for this, I was like, hmm, okay. Now the trailer for this came out around the same time as the trailer for Barbarian. And I was like, oh my God, we're getting so much Justin Long and horror, I'm so excited. But when I did see the trailer for this one, I was like, hmm, it looks like it could go either way. It's looking a little bit generic, all right. I know Neil Laboot is a playwright and he's wrote many plays that I have read in the past. So I kind of expected this to be a lot of dialogue and that's not a bad thing for me. I do like very dialogue heavy things. And of course, a lot of it did feel like a play. And again, that is okay for me because I love theater and so it was fun. I was pleasantly surprised about this film and I thought Kate Bosworth was really great in this and I think she does a great job at being very mysterious and captivating and Justin Long just does an incredible job at playing this kind of role where he he's either trying to be a good guy and he's an asshole actually or he's that character that is like a hopeless romantic who doesn't get the girl and it's a whole thing yeah i mean he he always plays these characters but he plays them really great i've actually had a lot of fun seeing Justin long play these darker characters that are a bit more icky and gross he just does a great job uh, i mean he's incredible Honestly, there was a lot of really like steamy scenes in this film and a lot of it felt very, very real. And I guess that is because Kate Bosworth and Justin Long are actually dating in real life. So their chemistry was definitely exuding off the screen. And so I really love that. That really helped this film. And I thought the ending was great. I mean, it was a little abrupt, a little short, but it did its job and I liked it a lot. I definitely think you guys should check it out. If you haven't, I gave this one three stars out of five. Okay, next up we have Terrifier 2. <laughs> I have been doing nothing but talk about Terrifier 2 on the channel and like on every social media. Um, I actually did an entire dedicated review to Terrifier 2, so if you want to know more about my thoughts on the film and my analysis of certain things in the film, then you should definitely check out that review. I'm just gonna link it right up there. I think you should definitely believe the hype of Terrifier 2. I think that this is such a triumph in indie horror filmmaking and just indie filmmaking in general. This little film that was crowdfunded hit nine million dollars at the box office and it constantly kept getting picked up to be in theaters like weekend after weekend and that really is incredible and it is all because of the fans and all of the support so i just love seeing that i'm so proud of the entire cast and crew of this film and this film is a big step up from terrifier i love terrifier and i also love all hallows eve but Terrifier 2 feels like the film that Damien Leone has always been wanting to make and give us. And I think everybody did a phenomenal job. Art the Clown is 10 times more iconic in this one than he is in Terrifier. And our final girl in the film, who's played by Lauren Lavera, does an amazing job as well automatically iconic. And uh, yeah, it's so much fun. I could see myself re-watching this film over and over and over again. And it really doesn't feel two hours and 30 minutes long. I mean, it's, it's that much fun. So I highly recommend it. And if you're interested in supporting indie horror filmmaking and indie filmmaking in general, you should definitely check out the work from Damien Leone. Okay, and next up we have one that, <sighs> it was so disappointing for me. Um, <laughs> 
we have Even the Wind is Afraid. This is actually a Mexican horror film and it is from 1968. Now, I've been wanting to delve more into Latine horror films and potentially cover them on the channel. I originally wanted to do that for Hispanic Heritage Month, but with all of the insane amount of horror releases we were getting, I just did not have time to do that. But I do plan to cover more Latine horror films on the channel as I feel like there are a lot that are underrated and that a lot of you may not know. And I really do want to shed light on them because I think they deserve it. And now I do think it is worth watching even The Wind is Afraid, but, um, I think this film, it lacks in plot and it gets very convoluted. There's a lot of things happening, but really nothing at the same time. Uh, and that's really unfortunate. I actually watched this film with my patrons as part of our monthly movie nights. And I think that was probably the best way to watch it because if I would have watched this by myself, I probably would have ended up falling asleep and I'm really sad to say that so many people told me that this film has a lot of Jalo elements and vibes, but I actually didn't get any of that. I think actually the most Jalo thing about this is the poster of the film. I think it's really gorgeous. It has the title in Spanish, Hasta el viento tiene miedo. And it's so sad. The poster is so stunning. It is so stunning and the poster does give a lot of Jalo vibes, but the film itself, not really like any Jolly. Um, I mean, there really is no whodunit kind of story. And uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. It was a bit of a snooze fest. This one is available on Tubi though, if you guys do want to check it out and delve more into Latine Har. Next up, Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Okay, next up is Evil Bong 420. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so Evil Bong 420, what is there to say? I don't think this is one of the best in the Evil Bong franchise. Now, if you're not into Charles Band or Full Moon features at all, you probably are not gonna care for this. Uh, this film is 53 minutes. I ended up just watching it because I was like, all right, maybe it's fun. Um, I've had fun with previous Evil Bong films. I actually did film a couple of Full Moon features watch along slash commentaries with Jay from Bloodbath TV and, um, they are over on his channel and we did have a lot of fun so i was delving more into the evil bong universe and uh this one's definitely not the best uh i actually really didn't like this one i thought it was not only really boring but they were just doing a lot of really questionable things and i'm not really sure if they found it funny or what they were trying to do but uh all y'all need to know is that there's this like very bizarre sex scene of the ginger dead man and this like woman. And I didn't think that I would have to sit through seeing a gingerbread cookie have sex with an actual woman. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really hard to think of and it may have scarred me for life. I kind of hated that. Uh, yeah, this was just really forgettable and uh, yeah, really not the best. And really just, it's a no. Uh, yeah. I actually gave Evil Bong 420 a half a star. So that's all you need to know, right? Next up, I ended up watching this series that was on Netflix, which is directed by Ryan Murphy and that is The Watcher. Um, yeah, I only watched The Watcher because of Naomi Watts and Bobby Cannavale, who I am a fan of. So I was like, all right, I'll delve in. I also heard Jennifer Coolidge is in this and everybody was talking about her performance. I was pleasantly surprised to see Mia Farrow in the series as well. 
<laughs> it's actually really nice to see her back in the horror genre. She's so much fun. I just adore her. She's such a good actress. Unfortunately, uh, The Watcher, it was, it was pretty entertaining in the sense of like you throw it on and you're cleaning up or you're doing some work at home and you want something in the background. Yeah, because it's an easy watch. Uh, you don't have to pay too much attention. It's a pretty straightforward kind of story, I feel like. I actually did hear about this case first on BuzzFeed Unsolved. And uh, so I didn't know about the case, but I don't know. This show was very Ryan Murphy. And if you like Ryan Murphy, that's totally okay. Uh, there's just something about Ryan Murphy for me that just doesn't hit. I think he does things that are a bit cheesy and he easily makes things really corny. And uh, yeah, it, it was a bit rough for certain episodes. And honestly, I only finished it because I was like, well, I may as well finish it. I think it was only eight episodes. So, and it's an easy watch, but uh, I don't think you need to run to Netflix or get a Netflix subscription to watch The Watcher. Uh, <laughs> you could probably pass on it. I ended up giving it three out of five because it is entertaining and Naomi Watts and Bobby Cannavale are really great. And so is Jennifer Coolidge. I mean, she was probably my favorite part. She was really great. She's such an icon. All right, next up we have Halloween Ends. I actually did an entire dedicated review to Halloween Ends. I really don't even want to talk much about this because this was a lot to unpack in my review. <laughs> If you want to know more in depth my thoughts, you can definitely check out my review for this. Um, yeah, this is the final installment of the trilogy that is made by David Gordon Green. And uh, it's unfortunate that this was how we ended this trilogy. Um, yeah, I, there was some things that were kind of cool about this film, but I don't think it is the film that we needed to end this trilogy. And uh, that's really all I'll say about that. <laughs> okay, now we can move on to a fun one. I finally ended up watching Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. And I'm so happy I did. This was a lot of fun. I watched this with my best friend, Melissa, and we actually had a lot of fun with this film. This is also one that I'm not sure if I wanna do a dedicated review or not. I probably won't at this point, but this was a lot of fun. And I do understand actually why some people didn't like this film. Uh, I do think it's for a very specific audience. Um, I thought it was a lot of fun and I thought that the entire cast was incredible. I really, really loved Rachel Sennett who just did an incredible job and she ended up being probably my favorite character in the entire film. She was a lot of fun to watch and I did really like Pete Davidson in this film as well. I thought he was really funny. And uh, yeah, it's a short and sweet film. It's 94 minutes. I think it's a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> Next up, we have Psycho. And this is the original film from 1960. I have seen this film before many, many times but I've actually been trying to watch the entire franchise because I've never seen all of them. I've only seen the first one. So I did end up rewatching Psycho and this film is such a banger. I mean, there really isn't too much to say. It's a banger. I give it a five out of five. I think this is one of those films that is not only iconic, but it's so important for the horror genre. And it really did pave the way for so many other horror films. And yeah, I just have to really appreciate it. Anthony Perkins is so incredible in this film and I just love it so much. It's so well directed, it's so well acted and it has tons of rewatchability. Rewatching it, it kind of felt like the first time watching it again. Like I just love it, I love it. And the more you rewatch it, the more you pick up on all these little subtleties that Anthony Perkins has in his performance. And I am so obsessed with that. I mean, he was really incredible. He really dived 
deep into that role and did such an amazing job. And yeah, I love this film. And this poster, I just, I love this poster. I love this film so much. I actually do plan to do an entire video on the Psycho franchise and possibly Bates Motel. Um, let me know in the comments if you would be interested in seeing a video like that. I'm not too sure if I'm going to do it, but if a lot of you are interested, then I would definitely make that a priority. Uh, right now, so far, I've watched Psycho, Psycho 2, and Psycho 3. So, yeah, and they're all, like, crazy. It's crazy, like, how good they are as well. Oh, my goodness. Okay, next up, oh, my goodness, yeah. Oh my god, we're ending on like a slightly bad note, but it's fine. Next up we have VHS 99. <sighs> okay, so it's so sad because I really do, I really do want to like the VHS franchise. But there's something about this franchise, it, it just doesn't do it for me. It doesn't do it for me. I think the first film... I really liked it and I I still rewatch it. I think it's a lot of fun. I don't think every segment in it is that good, but I think it is the one that has probably the best segments. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't like VHS 99. A lot of it for me was very try hard. I just, this just isn't for me. I'm also really over this like, nostalgia thing for the 90s and especially for the 80s and all that. So I'm just kind of tired of that. I feel like they've been doing that with a lot of things recently and I'm kind of just exhausted of that. Like, okay, we get it. It's fine. I'm, I'm tired of it. Uh, there's a lot of segments in here that I didn't really like. I don't remember the name of that one segment where it was like a game show. Um, and they really nailed the vibe making it feel like the game the game shows that used to be on TV, like on Nickelodeon with kids and stuff like that. It, yeah, they did nail that. But there was something about that segment that just like irked me. It was so annoying and just like, I just I hated it. <laughs> I just hated it so much. I don't know. Uh, it's not, it's just not for me. Uh, these kind of films are just not for me. I actually didn't like the VHS film too much that was before this one. I think it was 94 or something. Um, yeah, I thought that one was just okay. I did like the Ratma segment from that one. But yeah, I mean, these movies are just not for me. They're just... I don't know who's the audience, but it, it's just not... It's not me. And that's it. So I gave VHS 99 one and a half stars because there was one segment that I liked, but I felt like they ultimately kind of ruined it. And it was the one where this girl is really trying to get into the sorority and they basically pull this prank on her to see if she survives. And if she does, she will get in the sorority. I don't want to spoil it too much in case you haven't seen the film. So I'm gonna keep it very vague, but I did think that that segment was somewhat cool until there was this moment where they show us what this thing, this entity looks like. And for me, it was giving Spirit Halloween vibes and uh, yeah, it just wasn't for me. I felt like they kind of ruined it. Sometimes I feel like we don't need to see everything and that makes things scarier, but that's just me. And yeah, VHS films, not really for me, but if you like them, that's really cool. Uh, yeah, and that is everything that I watched in October. I watched a lot. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So we watched a lot in October, a lot, but I am so excited to see what's to come in November. There was so many horror films being released in October so much content, so much to, <laughs> so much to take in, but it really was a great month for horror. I mean, this year in general has been an incredible year for horror and indie horror, and it's just been 
It's been a great year for the genre. All right, you guys, that is it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe as it really helps me a lot. And be sure to click that little notification bell to be up to date every single time I upload. And let me know in the comments what was your favorite watch of October. I'd love to talk about it. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.